Good evening, everybody. I'm Sultry Asian. <laughs> yeah, this is great for my ego. Thanks very much. I'm here to introduce um, our next speaker, and I have to say that we have a fantastic team here at SE Village, but we wouldn't be a fantastic team without a fantastic leader. This is Chris Hagnagy, the CEO of Social Engineer LLC and socialengineer.org. He's the author of three books, Social Engineering, The Heart of, Art of Human Hacking, Unmasking the Social Engineer, and Fishing Dark Waters. So he has had a lot of time in the business and a lot of experience in the business, and he is here to talk to you tonight about special Jedi mind tricks. He is um, awesome when it comes to convincing people to do things that they shouldn't do. So without further ado, everybody, Chris Hadnagy. The best introduction of my life. Oh, I only have five minutes left as of now? Okay. Oh, actually, I should probably start my own timer. There we go. Okay. So, seven Jedi mind tricks to help you influence your target without a word. So, first of all, I want to ask, how many first-time DEF CONers? Holy mackerel, really? Wow. Wow. Wow, I love you all. That's amazing. That's really crazy. I never get that many hands. Okay, so... I, I want to start off uh, just talking a little bit about what social engineering is before we get into actually using any kind of mind tricks, right? So I define social engineering as any act that influences a person to take an action that may or may not be in their best interest. And I, I use a pretty broad definition which is way different than what you'll find online because what you'll find online a lot of times involves the word manipulation and that definitely is part of it, but I think that it's not always negative. Right? Now, I, I know you're going to think I'm trying to SEU, you, but I really have a valid question. How many guys in the room have daughters? Okay, I do too. As a matter of fact, she's right here. Okay? Woo! Now, <laughs> and I swore I would never, one, bring her to Vegas, <laughs> and two, bring her here to DEF CON. But yet, she's here. How does that happen? Well, there's all these different things we can talk about in psychology, but in essence, she made a really valid argument that it was her right to come here and be with me in DEF CON, supporting me and learning about the industry, because this is what I want her to do with her life, and how can she learn to do it if she's not here? Pretty valid argument, right? So solid reasoning mixed with all the um, emotions and feelings of her being my daughter, and bam, she's here. There may or may not also be pictures on the internet of me wearing a pink scarf having my fingernails painted while drinking tea. Um, and I think any guy in the audience that has a daughter can probably relate to said things, things that we would never think we would do. Now if you study those very positive examples of social engineering and you learn how that works psych psychologically, the bad guys are doing the same things. Right? So I think from a security perspective, and let's assume everyone in the room is here to learn how to do this for the good, then we have to analyze how to use the principles of influence to become better communicators and social engineers, so that way we can become better security professionals. So I find this to be a very valid topic. So what is influence, and why is it so powerful? Well, I like this definition of influence, of trying to get someone to do something and make it their idea. Thought I heard horns being, I was gonna go nuts. Okay, <laughs> so trying to get someone to do something and make it their idea. Influence, right? Different than manipulation, where you get someone to do something and it's your idea. I've heard other definitions like influence benefits both you and the target, whereas manipulation only benefits you. So we wanna talk about influence because we wanna talk about how to get people to want to do the things that you want to do. And we can do a lot of talking about verbals and things like that, but we're gonna focus on things that you can practice every day non-verbally that will help you become a better influencer. Here's the first one. It's called the Duchenne smile. Now if you've never heard of, of this guy, he was a, um, a French researcher named Duchenne. At the time people thought that you can't force, uh, you can't fake a real smile. So Duchenne didn't think that way. He thought, well you can, you can actually fake a real smile. And he had an interesting way of proving it. He uh, drove around the French countryside and he got a prisoner out of prison and drilled a couple holes in the side of his face and stuck a couple electrodes in those holes and shocked the crap out of him. And the, guess what the guy did? He really smiled. 
<laughs> now, that doesn't really make sense that he would really smile, but he did. He really smiled. Why? Well, because he, uh, he triggered the ocularis uh, orbitalis. Did I say that right, Michelle, for once? I did. Yes, I win. Uh, the ocularis orbitalis nerve, which is the, the difference between a fake and a real smile. Fake smiles only engage the mouth. Real smiles engage the whole face. And Duchenne proved that we can actually fake that, right? So we now call that the Duchenne smile, what is the real smile. Now, what's great is that the picture of him that you most commonly see, there is no real smile on his face. But he made this guy really smile. I just wanted to show you that once again. There you go, one more time. Okay. Now, compare and contrast. Here's some really amazing pictures that Michelle helped me find on the internet of the same people. Which side is the real smile? Right. Excellent, right? We could see that very clearly. And what's amazing, and we can't do this from this angle or I can't do it here on the screen, but if you were to cover her mouth, you could still tell she's smiling, right? Based on her eyes. If you were to cover her eyes, you could definitely tell she's smiling. Whereas on the picture on the left, she definitely looks happy when you see the whole face, but not if you just cover, let's say if you covered her mouth, you would not see smiling in her eyes and vice versa. So a real smile engages the whole face and you don't need the whole face to see that someone is happy. So you can practice this. Well, how do you practice this? There's a couple different ways you can do that. First, what really helps is looking at pictures of people really smiling. Why does that work? Well, our brains like to mimic the things that we see. We oftentimes mimic the facial expressions that we see. If you ever had this experience, you're walking down a street, maybe you're walking past a restaurant, and there's a glass in between you, a window, and you see a group of people in the restaurant laughing and having a good time. Well, what do you do? You're doing what the majority of you are doing right now, smiling, thinking about it. <laughs> so you had that experience and it triggers an actual smile. So when we see people who are laughing and smiling, we tend to recreate those same facial expressions and the same emotions that go with it. So one of the first things you can do is look at people that are really smiling. Take a look at those pictures. And then you can practice doing that. And it's not too hard, right? You can practice getting your whole face involved in a smile, and eventually it may not be natural for you if that's not something you do, but eventually, after time, practicing it, it becomes more of a habit, and you learn to do it. Now, you have to be cautious at first when you're practicing. I suggest practicing at home, in a mirror with your family, because if you're fake, you start doing this, and it looks like you're constipated and not smiling. <laughs> so you want to you know, be cautious of your practice out in the, in the wild. So this, real or fake? Real. Real. Real or fake? Fake. Hmm, very good, class. How about this? Real. Good. You guys pass. You all get certified in real smiles. Now, this is an easy one, but often, what's interesting, oftentimes, is that we, we don't do it, do we? We walk through our life, we walk through the hallways, you'll see this here at DEF CON, and we are attached to our devices, and we don't smile. And why is that? I don't really know the answer. I'd like to know the answer. But people tend to think that maybe, I know in some cultures, um, we were just, uh, my family and I were just in Russia, and I learned something interesting about the culture there, is that smiling is considered a weakness in, in some areas of Russia. And if you smile, they think you're up to something and you're shady. Right? So it's almost a cult, in some cultures, it's a cultural thing where smiling can make it seem weird. So you want to be cautious with that because you don't want to be creepy, right? You don't want to be walking by people going, hey, 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 you know, like you're just like hit some crack or something. So you want to be cautious with how much, you know, you want to be weird looking, but you want to practice genuine smiles because as you guys just experienced, looking at them even on a screen will trigger happy emotions in you and it will make people more compliant with your demands. So if we can trigger happy emotions, then we can trigger more compliancy. Here's number two, the eyebrow flash. I think I have a video to show you how this works. Oh, yeah. Now, what does that mean? Okay. <laughs> that was a little creepy. See, that was a, not, that was a creepy, yeah, it sounded like, let me tell you why I said, oh, yeah, because that sounded really weird. <laughs> Maybe I should back up and redo that slide. Okay. So... <laughs> These are, what, <laughs> these are what are called conversational signals. So without words, if you were talking to someone and they were to do that, they were to raise their eyebrows, what did they just say to you? No. Okay, so those are the emotions. You're getting some emotions. But imagine this. Surprise would also involve the mouth, like, 
right? That would be more like surprise. So very good. But if someone is just talking, if you're just conversing, and you're saying something like, oh, yeah, I went over to this talk, and this guy was talking about emotions, and it, it was okay. You know, it was not bad. And they went like this. What do they say? What are they saying? I'm sorry? Ooh, I heard, it. I heard so many answers. Okay, keep talking. Skepticism. Interest. Okay, all three of those are true. Right? So it, it, depending on the other parts of the face, it could be, yeah, tell me more. I'm interested. It can also be skepticism if it's maybe more of a downward motion with the eyebrows, or it could be I'm interested in what you're saying. So this is a conversational signal telling somebody that you want to hear more. Now, think about this. What does that tell the other person, the talker, the one who is sending out the message? If you are telling them you are interested, what does that say? You're engaged. Excellent. What else? I heard some. Keep talking. Keep talking. So I'm interested in you. I'm listening, active listening, and I want you to tell me more. How validating is that? And the more you talk, the less your targets are going to be compliant. The more they talk, the more compliant your targets will become. So you can influence them by keeping them talking. Right? And this is just a, a great principle of conversation, whether you're doing it in social engineering or just doing it at home or just natural conversation. So a really good one. And, and Michelle did find me a male one just in case, you know. Yeah. Yeah, and that's not creepy at all. No. I thought it worked better before. Okay. Now let's talk about the next one, number three. I was going to say this wrong, but you know, this, let's just, let's reword that. Proximix, right? Anyone say that better than me? Okay, no, that's good. I feel better. So this is like our, our space allowance. What we, how close and personal we want to be. Like right now, some of you are probably uncomfortable because of how close you are to each other. But what determines how close people can get to you? Okay, I heard some. Culture, society. What else? Personal preference. What? Say it here, sir. You in the white shirt. Gender. Gender? Okay. Oh, yeah. S smell. <laughs> yeah, that's DEF CON right there, my friends. <laughs> Interest, you said? Context. Context. Oh, I like that. So all of these are true statements, right? So also, let me add some things to that. The level of rapport that you feel with the person you are interacting with, the relationship you have with them, will determine the closeness uh, including with culture and other things, right? So like in, in Norway, what is personal space tends to be a, a three-foot radius. That's personal space, right? Yeah, all right, so, but in Japan, like there is no such thing as personal space. If you can see light, it's, 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 you're not, you're too far away, right? So, I mean, that, that's, and why is that? Well, the cultures are different, but rapport will also determine that. For example, imagine this. You're standing here, and a total stranger walks up to you and puts his hand on your stomach and starts to rub it. <laughs> yeah, and most of you are not going to feel that way, right? Most of you are going to feel the way you're all looking right now, which is really uncomfortable. That was like the awkward laugh, like, oh, yeah, it's weird and creepy. Okay, why? Well, you don't have a relationship with that person, right? There's no rapport there and trust, so that's a really intimate area for someone to be able to come up and, and be that close to you. But uh, proxemics is, is learning how to use personal space, right? So here's some examples. Like a team, it's okay to hug. All right now, where's D uh, Dave left? He had to go to the meeting. But I, I wanted him to hear this part, because sometimes people don't want to be hugged long and awkwardly, <laughs> right? Sometimes people don't like long, awkward hugs where there's heavy breathing on the neck and things like that. It's weird, right? Now, what allows for that? Well, that's relationship, right? You can see the mom and daughter there, that makes sense. Whereas if that same situation was in the bottom picture in the business setting, it would look more like this. Creepy. <laughs> Creepy. Yeah. Yeah, if you ever see a, on your targets, if you ever see the face like that dog, you know you're doing something wrong, okay? You're doing something wrong here. So why is this important? Well, I'll give you a personal example. So I'm raised in New York City. I'm raised in the New York area, and I'm an Italian. Thank you. New York, yeah, that's right. So I'm raised Italian in New York. What does that mean about the level of touching in my family? No, you don't know nothing about Italians. What? Lots of touching and slapping and pinching and hitting and hugging, all sorts. And then my grandma would walk up to me, slap me in the face, curse at me, and give me five bucks if I didn't tell my parents. Right? And this was the way it went. 
You know, this is the way you show the fix, and you're so effing cute and slap you. It's like, ah, oh, thanks, Grandma. I love you too. You know, this is, it was a lot of personal touching, right? So because of that, I don't have a problem. I really don't have a problem with close proximity. I don't have a problem with hugs. I don't have a problem with touching. I don't have a problem with that. But that doesn't mean that everyone else is the same. So what do I have to learn if I'm going to be a good social engineer it's to be able to read those signs when people are uncomfortable? Right, because it can, it can make, it can really break your chance to be influential. It can break rapport if you are not aware of what your proximity is allowed in, in when you're, inter, when you're um, interacting with your targets. So you really have to learn these things and that takes some time. So what does it mean? Well, it's always best to err on the side of caution right, when it comes to these things and not take liberties just because it's comfortable to you. So when it comes to this particular one, it's nice to, to show that, um, that you are aware of personal space and you're not, you're not too creepy, especially when it's cross-gender. And I say this more so for guys to girls than girls to guys, because guys, right? I mean, it's not, if a girl gets really close to us, we're like, yes, win! You know, I love it, I don't care, right? I mean, they can come up and like, just be right next to you and be like, yes. And if we do it, we're creepers. So you gotta be aware of that, okay? You gotta be aware of that. Um, and, and especially when it comes to cultural. Okay. Size is a, th a thing too, right? I'm really tall, so you got to be cautious because what happens to your targets if when you get close to them and they have to interact with you, they're doing this. This isn't comfortable, is it? Yeah, it's intimidating, exactly. And it's uncomfortable to, be, to have to look up like this, so you're going to ruin the ability to build rapport with your targets if they have to be uncomfortable while conversing with you. So if you're dealing with a shorter person, it's always best to stand back a little bit. Right, to stand back so they can look at you even, but not so far back that it looks odd because you don't want to be near them. There's some good tips there on that. Number four, power language. These are things that are verbal, but they're not, right? So something like a, what do you think of when you hear a sigh? Exasperation, Exasperation. what else? I'm sorry? Exhaustion, good. Boredom, okay. So all of these are true. And if you were standing there and you heard someone, now in this room it may not be the same uh, because we're here for a purpose, but if you're in public and you hear someone sigh, whether you decide to ask what's wrong or not, we start to think, I wonder what's wrong with that person. And if you're with a person who's, who has empathy and compassion, if you're in a public area and you sigh, what will occur most times is they'll ask you what's wrong. Hey, is everything okay? What's wrong? So a sigh is a great way to elicit a response from a person that you're looking to interact with, right? Now, you have to have a response that makes sense, right? So you know, this is a part you gotta follow up with because if you sigh and you ask people what's, if someone asks you what's wrong, you gotta have a good storyline, right? You can't, you can't be like, well, you know, when I was five, my mom beat me, then my dog died. Because people don't wanna be that involved right now, right? They really don't. I just asked you what's wrong. So you want to have an answer that allows for a conversation and not like they're calling the, the hotline for your help. You know what I mean? <laughs> so uh, power language, can, it will trigger an inquiry, even if it's not right away, and people will start to think, I wonder what's wrong there, you know, if I should ask for help. And if you're doing all those other parts right, then it can help in also building that rapport and having people want to communicate with you. Oh, here's a good one. Number five. <laughs> Eye contact, and this is super important, right? Um, and now, you know, you gotta really balance this, and this is a hard one for some people. It really is, especially us computer guys, right? We spend so much time with, with technology, like looking at another human is almost scary, right? So we really gotta practice this one, and we gotta practice it right. I've been with people like when they're practicing eye contact, they stare at you, and it's like, like you almost feel like they wanna hurt you, you know, they're like. Right? Yeah, yeah, it's really scary. Don't do that. Yeah, see? So you got to be really careful with how intense your eye contact is. And, and so you want to really practice that with people that know you and, and, and love you, especially if it's a weakness of yours. A great place to practice this is with your family, with eye contact. And learning to, to look at people without being intently gazed upon them, without looking psychotic or creepy, it's a very powerful thing. It's a very powerful form of influence. If you make eye contact with people when you're communicating, it says, I actually care about you. I'm looking at you. I, I want to communicate with you as a person. And it's very different than if I just kind of, if you notice, if I just look over everyone's heads in the audience and I'm not really paying attention, it's very different feel 
and how, and how personal this can be than making eye contact with people when you're speaking to them. It really helps to build rapport. Am I going too fast? I'm going too fast. I need to slow down. Mom told me to slow down. Sorry. Oh, no, Hannah says I only have 10 minutes left. <laughs> Am I going too fast? Sorry, guys. Okay. Well, I'll slow down a little anyway because I'm probably, and I naturally talk fast. That's what happens. So let me take a drink. This will be a, a um, fake pause. Okay. So back to eye contact. And what's important um, about eye contact is also knowing when it can become uncomfortable for the person you're interacting with, right? So if the person you're interacting with is nervous and not making eye contact, you don't want to force it. You don't want to be like, hey, yeah, okay. right? So you want to be really careful that you're also respecting, uh, you're respecting them. Now, for, from the older generation, if you're dealing with older generations, you always looked at people when you spoke to them, right? You always looked at them. And my grandma would say, you always look at people when they talk to you. You never look away. But, so you have to also know culturally, um, gender, age, what's acceptable and what's not. Probably one of the biggest ones. Non-sexual touch. And it's important to understand what this means because um, human, interacting, human interaction and touching is a very powerful way to build rapport but only when it's done appropriately and non-sexually. So before we talked about uh, proximity and how that works, right? And where the areas of the body that are acceptable to touch and not, I mean, some of them are very obvious. We don't have to go into them, but some of them may not be so obvious, right? Like, like the stomach or the lower back, uh, thighs, anything like in this area. These are unacceptable to touch on strangers, right? You don't just <laughs> walk up to people. <laughs> <laughs> and do that. That's really weird, right? I wish Dave was here for this because even with certain really close relationships, it's inappropriate to touch areas, you know, in certain places because it doesn't build rapport. It doesn't make you feel comfortable. It makes you feel uncomfortable and, and ashamed of yourself. Anyhow, so <laughs> you got to be really careful with how you do that. Now, why is this such a powerful thing if you can master this? Um, and, and before we even talk about that, let's talk about how you master it. So this takes a lot of practice, right? Knowing when it's appropriate. And you'll notice too, because sometimes when you're interacting with people, they will tell you when it's okay because they will start doing it. Uh, you ever have people you, you, you walk up to and you, they right away put their, their hand on your shoulder? Right? They're saying it's okay then for, for you to, to reciprocate that. Or you ever talk with someone and they do the arm touch? They do the arm touch, right? They touch you in the arm when they're talking to you. That's an that's acceptable form of non-sexual touch, right? Because these are all okay places. When it's done appropriately, it releases a chemical called oxytocin uh, in the brain. And oxytocin is uh, something that many people have researched, but uh, one of the more current researchers is Dr. Paul Zak. He wrote a book called The Moral Molecule. And it talks about oxytocin being um, the chemical that they've linked to the feeling of trust. And we, when we feel trust, when we feel rapport, oxytocin is released. So this is a powerful thing. Because think about that. If you can release oxytocin in your targets, they feel trust and they feel it towards you. And that's a really powerful thing to, to be able to do to, to people you're trying to influence. If they trust you and then you ask for something, they're more likely to comply with the ask, aren't they? Because you've built trust with them and you've done it chemically. Some things to know about oxytocin, because I see some of you like writing it down or thinking about it. If you search for oxytocin, you will find that they sell oxytocin on Amazon. Um, it's not really oxytocin, okay? It's not. It's more of like a like a like an alcohol uh, tincture, you know. That it's like mostly alcohol and then a little bit of something they're calling oxytocin. And and the doc uh, Paul Zach, he says uh, if you were actually trying to use that to build trust in people, I'll just buy this and put it in a girl's drink and she'll trust me. Um, well, first of all, you need to either inject it or they need to inhale it. So unless you plan on bringing a pump and one and a half gallons to a bar and pumping it into a girl's nose, it's not going to work to build trust. Yeah, okay. No, you can't do it. It's not, not going to work. You can't. You're not going to pump a gallon and a half of liquid into a girl's nose at the bar. That's not going to really build trust. Hey, can you just sit here for a second? Funk, you know, chunk, 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 chunk. Yeah, just a minute more and you'll be trusting me, you know. So don't, so don't think that will work. So 
Um, online purchased oxytocin is not the way to go. I say do it naturally by building trust through influence and, and good emotions, okay? Uh, something else I know about oxytocin has a very short shelf life, but it also stays with you, the reason for it. Uh, Dr. Zach did a really cool study on oxytocin where they found out that once there was a relationship that the same release of oxytocin occurred even when they were interacting with the person through social media. So you have a good relationship with your boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, kids. When you're, when you're reacting with them on Facebook Messenger or Twitter or whatever, the same amount of oxytocin is getting released in your bloodstream than when you're sitting with them in person. So really powerful. So imagine this from a social engineering perspective. If you could be the source of oxytocin or one of them for your targets, then they'll interact, they'll feel that way with you regardless if they're interacting with you in person or through email or phone. And that's a really, really powerful thing. But one of the, one of the great ways to, to, uh, to release it is non-sexual touch. I need, a, I need a, um, someone to come up here. I need a, a demonstrator. Anyone, okay, you come up here. I want to just show you one thing that, you, that some people do. No, yeah, so first, so, Woo. no, just kidding. No, that's not the way you do it. That's not the way you do it. <laughs> Horrible example. But sometimes we do this when we greet people, and if you see people do this, this is a really great way to ruin rapport. Thank you. Thank you. Give him a random applause. Okay. <laughs> that is not a positive form of non-sexual touch. Okay? Because what you're saying is I'm, I'm in control. And when you're in control, it doesn't build rapport. So you want to build rapport with people. Uh, let them be in control, right? So doing that, if, I, you know what? I have to work on this myself because that tends to be my natural habit is to kind of put a hand over the hand when I'm shaking. So you really have to be aware of that, how that makes some people feel very captive. And it looks very captive, like you're just trying to be the top guy or gal. So be really cautious with that, especially cross-gender. We see this to be very common. Um, can, I, can I ask you? Okay, come here. Another one that happens with, uh, between male and females when they shake hands. To do like the upper arm grab. You see this, you really do. Like, hey, I'm not letting go until, <laughs> you can't go anywhere until I say it. Okay. You see, it's uncomfortable. Hug her. See? Hug see? Her. <laughs> Hug her. <laughs> it's uncomfortable. You see, that's what she said, and this was even a demonstration, and it's uncomfortable. So if you have the habit of doing that, um, it's not a great form of non-sexual touch. And you can see there was no intimate areas interacted with on either of, of, our, of our guests, right? That, ne that never occurred. But it still makes people feel uncomfortable if you try to take control. So be cautious with that if you do it, but really work on the... Um, non-sexual touch, which could be used good with humor. So you make a joke, it could be some touching. Or when you're just building rapport, if they make a joke and you laugh, sometimes it's okay to put a hand on a shoulder, touch the, the forearm, something like that is a great area to release oxytocin. And then last but not least is open ventral displays. I'll tell you, uh, Bill Clinton had this down pat. He really did. I mean, he had this down pat. He, so ventral being the, the, the open side, the underside, right? So when you talk, imagine this is commanding, right? So this is, hey, you're going to do this. You're going to do this. But this is inviting. Hey, why don't you come with me? Why don't you come with me and we'll go do this together? So inviting or commanding, which one would you rather be? Well, if you're saying commanding, it's going to be much harder for you to build rapport. Inviting works well. And you can do this without any words you know, so, of course, adding words makes more sense if, you, if I were to stand here for an hour going. <laughs> Not going to really mean too much to any of you. But when you mix it with words, it says, I trust you. Right? Any ventral side. Head tilts is another ventral display. Because it says, I bare my neck to you. So it makes it easy. You've got to be careful with head tilts. Guys, especially, if you're not a natural head tilter and you try to tilt your head and it's too much... This is the way you look. And then you mix it with your psychotic eye contact and your smile and... 
You get that, okay? That is not good. No rapport has been built. I've ruined every bounce of rapport with any of you in the room right now. So you don't want to do that. But you practice this, okay? You practice these things so you get the right. It doesn't take a lot of head tilt, right? It's not, it's not extreme. It's really very slight amount of head tilt. And you may have noticed I was doing it the whole time while I was up here with head tilt, try to put on a really genuine smile and using open ventrals. And it says something about you as a person. It says, I trust you, I'm open, I'm happy, it's okay to be my friend. And it really builds rapport uh, very, very, very fast. So how do you put this all together before we get to questions? Because this is one of the big things that comes up all the time is after you talk about these things, people say, well, how do you practice this? All right, what do you do with all of this? So the best place to practice is at home. It really is, if you, with your family. Because you can, you can be yourself with your family. You can practice, you can screw up, and they're still gonna love you because they're your family, right? So it's okay to practice with your family. And also, uh, what I find is family gatherings. Anytime that you have like a large gathering is a great time to start practice these, practicing these things. My, when I started learning this, my goal was to try to pick one and practice one at a time, because you don't want to overdo it, right? If you, if, if some of these may come naturally to you. Like, um, it, is, it is more common that you'll see women be natural at head tilting. Women will also be better at the non-sexual touch than guys. So if you're a female and you're practicing these things, you may naturally be better at some of these. Um, genuine smiles, you can, anyone can practice these. Right? And see the effect. Notice it. Try to really pay attention to what happens to the people you're interacting with when you try these things. And you'll see your relationships will open up, communications will open up, and that's when you can start applying this to actual security and social engineering. And this is a weird topic, right, for a security conference, but when we do uh, SE pen testing, like we actually get paid to break into places, and I know a lot of people call that red teaming, but I kind of think there's a difference, because red teaming is like you're scaling the walls and picking locks and you know, you're breaking in the dead of night. Our, our normal MO is to go into a company broad daylight Right, broad daylight, middle of the day, we walk in and we have some pretext where we're supposed to be there. And I find that it works much better when you can use influence with your targets instead of manipulation. They like you. And then when you come back later on and tell them that you broke in and that you have to do you know, education at this point, you're not the bad guy that made them feel dirty and bad, you know, like they were scared or fear. They feel good about having met you. And that works so much better when you apply these principles. And the side benefit as a security professional is if you can master these, it just makes you have better relationships overall. And it makes it easier just to be a human. And then where's that guy that asked about, will morality catch up with technology? Maybe, <laughs> I don't see it happening, but I think that's something that we can all work on. Okay, what do we have left? Good, we got plenty of time for questions because that's usually what happens. So, sir. Uh, a kind of a question on the interplay between eye contact and proximity. Yes. Okay, so the question was, um, if you look at people, are they less likely to let you get closer? Is that the question? Um, I actually find that to be the opposite. You know what's amazing is uh, two years ago or so, we had Apollo Robbins. Apollo Robbins was here. Him and I gave a, a speech together, and he actually taught me something really amazing about um, pickpocketing. And, and how he gets to do it. And it actually, he uses eye contact. Because if you look at somebody, it's very, it, they will really rarely break the eye contact from you if you're not being creepy, right? And then you can direct them. So if I were, let's say, if you were my target, and I were to walk up to you, and I were to make eye contact with you, you know I'm about to interact with you. And then if I were to start off with, excuse me, can I ask you a quick question? And I would, I'm, here's my map, I'm lost. Can you tell me where I'm at? This, I've just directed your focus to look at me, then my map, and now my hand can be anywhere, right? And I, well, that sounded really creepy, but <laughs> you, <laughs> you know what I meant. And my hand is on your stomach, rubbing it softly, <laughs> releasing oxytocin. Yes, that's exactly what I meant. I hope that answered it without too much creepiness. Yes, ma'am. Yes, okay. 
Uh, so, you know, there's actually a research paper, and I, and I, I can't say this about you because I don't know you, okay? So I'm just going to give you some things I know because you look like you have a very friendly face and a warm face. You have a wonderful smile. Um, yes, thank you. So she asked, uh, she said that when she stands there, like just alone, people have told her she seems unapproachable. So she asked if there's any advice to become more approachable. Uh, here's something that often happens to many of us. You hear about the study on RBF? Okay, I don't have to say it, right? So, um, resting bad face, we'll just say that because there's kids in the room, okay? So what happens is, and, and we're, we're, many of us may be guilty of this, when you're in thought, you make this face. And what is this? Hmm? <laughs> oh, yes, but what is it? What emotion? Yes, I'm sorry? Not fear, anger. Who said it? Raise your hand, please. Excellent. Anger. So you may not, you may not know. Everyone said something different. But either way, whatever people said, it was a bad one. So if we have that kind of, of thinking face, people look at us and they go, oh, I don't want to approach. Something's bad. Right? Um, also, certain nonverbals tend to be unapproaching. Like, I tend to stand very chest out, chin up, and that makes me unapproachable. Right, so I don't want to do this, because that makes me look like I'm now damaged. But lo you know, lowering the shoulders a little bit uh, and, and putting my hand in my pocket can say, look, I'm not, you know, I gesture so much too. I've actually slapped people walking by, which I have. I, mean, I was gesturing and I was like, Poof, and I was like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. So I've actually done that mistakenly. Um, you know, so you have to be careful with body language. If you're making yourself like a wall, think about it. in the animal kingdom, when there's a fight about to occur, what usually happens? Most animals make themselves bigger, right? Gorillas put their chest out, peacocks put their feathers out. Animals make themselves bigger before they're about to get aggressive. So when we make ourselves bigger, we're basically saying, I'm ready to be aggressive. So try to make yourself a little smaller. And I don't know if you do these things, you know, you're kind of small as it is, so I don't know how much, much smaller you can be. You'll be like a, she's a pokeball right now. I don't know, you know, so. <laughs> what about smiling? Smiling would also work great. Yeah, working on a genuine smile. Hey, we have someone at the mic, thank you. And it's not on. <laughs> Thanks, Evan. Thanks. Really love you. Do you have any other examples of paralanguage in addition to Psy? Yeah. So, um... <sighs> <laughs> so you all feel bad for me now because I got asked. Um, there are many examples. Well, let me think about some, okay? Because that is not something that's clear in my head. And I don't want to give you a fake answer because I hate doing that. Um, any kind of audible distress signal. So, so what, we're to, what, what I'm talking about in paralanguage is something that will trigger an inquiry as to your well-being. So, so people will go, oh, oh man, right? They just like kind of make noises like they're, they're hurt. Um, sighing, um, sniffling. These things are indicators that something is not right and it could trigger a response from someone asking you what's wrong. Are they usually audible? Yes, they're okay. usually, they're, usually they're audible so people can hear them. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, ma'am. Like, hmm. That works. Okay, so the, she added one. Hmm. Right? And that one actually has worked on me before. Right? At the grocery store, standing in the line, someone behind me goes, hmm. And I've turned to look. Is that for me or was that something else? Right? And, and it does. It brings a curiosity, right? Because you want to know what was the hmm about. Yeah, good one. Thank you. Excellent. You're going to actually ask me a question, really? You live with me. Um, a lot of people have different body language. Like, one thing for them can mean a totally different thing for another person, even though it may be the exact same movement or audible <laughs> noise. So how can you tell the difference? That's a good question. Huh. <laughs> And you see why I'm screwed, right? Right? You guys all see it, right? So, um, but, okay, so, well, here's some good things. Um, unlike, unlike micro expressions, body language is not universal. It is not, okay? There are, there are cultural um, body language uh, and hand signals and things like that. Like, like, how many of you, when you were a kid, this was um, got your nose? Right, got your nose, right, there's a got your nose game. Uh, don't play got your nose in Turkey because this is the vulgar sign for female genitalia, right? So, 
So you got to know cultural, it's a good question, because you got to know culturally what body language means. You know, um, Michelle's from Japan, and she says if you wanted, to, if your parent was going to call a child, they do it like this. This is like come fight. You know, so this is come here, and this is a different story. So you have to understand, I think, culturally what your body language is saying. That's very important. Um, otherwise, it can become off offensive. It can come off really offensive if you don't. Uh, but I still think that there are certain things that tend to be, um, and I, I don't want to use the, 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 the word universal because that's not the case with body language, but that tend to be more standard. You know, things like the touching, um, you have to understand culturally what's acceptable or not, but there still are areas that are unacceptable touching in, in most cultures, right? The, the, the private areas that you would not touch regardless of what culture you're in. So I think it's just a matter of learning about the culture of the people that you're interacting with and then um, understanding what that may mean for them. Yes, sir. You ever had a situation on an engagement where maybe you misread those clues and had it backfire on you or a all the time, are you kidding? Yeah, so uh, one, of the, one of the best things I've ever done in my life is learn how to read facial expressions, but it's also one of the worst things I've ever done in my life because when you first start learning, um, you feel like you have a superpower, right? Because you, you see people's emotion and then you know what they're feeling, but they're, you know what, but you don't know why, right? And this is something I learned personally from Dr. Eckman, just because I could see that you have it, but let's say you showed anger. Um, I, I could say, oh, that guy's angry because ha he hates my speech and he doesn't like me. But maybe you have a, a, a bad back and you moved and you, your back just twinged a little bit and that made you flash anger, right? Or, or maybe you got a text message from someone you don't like and that's what made you show anger. And it's really horrible to assume it's about me, right? So I can see the emotion, but I can't, I can't know why unless I do one thing and that's ask questions, which it may not be appropriate to do. Thank you, Hannah. So I think um, I've had it backfire often because I've misread someone's emotional content and then made assumptions and I understood why. Now, I try to control that. I've been working on that, so it's, but it does take some time. All the way in the back. Yes, you. Hi. Sure. So she asked about positive power language. So audible noises that express emotion, right? So a laughter, laughter, right? It tells people that you're having a good time, doesn't it? Um, a, a gasp will tell people what? <gasps> Says what? Yeah, surprise or fear, right? One of those things. So um, not that you would ever hear this, you know, but like a grunt, like, Ugh. okay, wait. Yeah, if you heard that, you probably just would run the other way, you know? <laughs> because that guy's like giving you the psychotic half smile, overhead tilt, <laughs> right, yeah. Okay, that's a bad one, but the other two were good. Sir? Uh, how efficient would you say uh, mirroring and mimicking body language? Uh, that's a great question. It was about mirroring and mimicking body language. So I actually love this, this, this question because um, in, the, in the late 80s, early 90s, we taught that, uh, not we, but you know, the, the psychologists, salespeople, they taught that uh, mirroring was a, was a really uh, positive thing to do all the time. But it can really backfire because if you mirror too much and you get caught, what happens? You've ruined rapport and trust, right? So what we say is, is, um, is notice the, the, like let's say the way the person's sitting, are they relaxed, are they tense? And you can mimic to an extent, but you don't want to mirror. Right, so example, if the person is, is sitting with their arms crossed like this, right, um, maybe, maybe you, you, cross, you, know, you cross one arm, you know, you were that, or you just put your hand up like this, that could be um, a similar expression of relaxation, but you don't wanna follow every movement because maybe this is comfortable for you too, so you sit like this, but then you move a minute later and you do this and you scratch your head and then I scratch on my head and then you put your hand down and I'll put my hand down. But what happens eventually if you get caught it becomes like you're parroting, and it ruins rapport. So it can actually make it really bad. Tons of hands. Okay, let's see. Yes, little one. That's actually a great event. Um, so besides the generational issue that you were talking about with your grandmother and eye contact, are there other aspects of age difference that come into play with nonverbal communication? Yeah, so the question was age difference uh, do they come into play with nonverbals? And it certainly does, doesn't it? Because um, depending on your age, it will seem more or less appropriate to act or be a certain way. Like for example, um, it would be highly inappropriate, even if I can master non-sexual touch, for me to walk up to let's say a 15-year-old girl and do it. 
right? I mean, imagine if that was your daughter and I'm now practicing rapport building with non-sexual touch on your 15-year-old daughter. I'm getting shivved, right? I mean, it's not, it's, not, it's not good. It doesn't matter if it works, if it's psychology. It doesn't matter. Right? It's, that's, it's bad. Don't do it, right? So definitely you have to be aware of all of those things, your age, your size, your status, who you are, and who your target is because if you don't, you can really mess up by, by using the wrong uh, type of nonverbal. So yes, you must worry about that, sir. There's, there's two. Let's go with the guy in the back, then you. So this works great when we know the person, we are meeting the person in person. How do we do this when we are on email, chat, uh, chat? Yeah. So the question was, how do you do this uh, when you're not in person? Okay, so uh, you're right. A lot of this is geared more towards in-person interaction with influence. Well, through email and, and uh, voice chat and phone, um, that's a whole different talk. But I will give you one thing, because there's a hot, lot of steps to it that don't involve any of this. But your, your nonverbals do affect your voice, especially when you're doing vishing, right? So if you smile, it actually changes the tone in your voice as when you frown, right? If you actually play the part nonverbally, so if I'm calling, I'm supposed to be the IT guy, and I know a lot, then you sit up straight, you, you puff your chest out. Uh, there's a great uh, social, psycho uh, social psychologist, uh, Amy Cootie. Uh, she has an amazing TED talk. If you haven't seen it, you should watch it. She talks about power posing and how um, posing for two minutes and like the Wonder Woman pose before you go do something that you're nervous about doing. Yeah, arms up in the air, the different poses that, that you see powerful people do. Doing that for just two minutes before you take part of the activity that's making you nervous um, will, will feed your body with the proper chemicals and emotions to make you feel powerful. Basically, you're SEing yourself. You're tricking yourself into saying, yes, I am confident. Your brain doesn't catch up for a little while until it's over. Then it goes, darn you, Chris. You really weren't confident. And that's what will happen when I go off the stage. You'll be like, I know you were faking. <laughs> and then I'll be exhausted back there on the floor dripping with sweat. Sir? Yeah, dude, stop. No. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so that's actually good. Um, I, don't, uh, um, I don't have any great advice for you right now. I'm going to think about it, okay, because I don't want to give you wrong advice. But I think it's just a matter of, of recognizing your, your target that you're speaking to and how they're interacting, right? Like, I don't feel right now that your eye contact is, in, is intense or inappropriate, right? I think what can be the worst is if you're making eye contact with people and your eyes wander and they're wondering if you're paying attention, right? So I think it's okay. Like you're the, the things to watch for are intent gazing or um, what do they call that? Like where you're kind of daydreaming where you're, you're not really looking at someone, you're kind of looking through them. And yeah, like zoning out, right? So you kind of do, yeah, I'm really listening to you. Yeah. Like that, that could be dangerous. Uh, so you want to watch out for that. But like our interaction here, I don't feel like you're overly intense at all. No, it's kind of nice, actually. <laughs> I meant that in a good way. I really did. I really did. I've had this experience in public. When I'm standing out in public, people just come up to me and start talking to me for no reason. I don't understand why they're talking to me. So I just missed your talk. Yeah, I, I can't tell you why. I'd have to see you standing in public. And then I'll come up and talk to you, you know. Some people have very friendly faces. You ever notice that? They just, their, their body language and their face just makes you look like, I think I can trust you, right? And, and that, that's, um, that, that could be good. That can also be bad because, you know, Ted Bundy had that face. So, uh, just saying, be careful, right? So he, he asked the question about de-escalating if you get caught, you're saying. Correct. So if you get caught. Um, that's a really good question. I don't have a great answer to because we rarely get caught. And I know that sounds really horrible. It's an arrogant answer, and I don't mean it that way. And I'm trying to think about if I, like, so you're saying if someone were to say, um, and I know your head tilting just, I mean, I, I guess I don't under, uh, maybe you can clarify. I don't, what company did you say you have? Okay, okay. So they're questioning your motive. Correct. Yeah. I obviously prepared Yes. Yep. In the engagement, have you ever gotten a little bit of suspicion? Yep. 100%. So I think what you do with that, so let's say you, you're, you practice this and you say, I'm going to go into the building with a, with a nice head tilt, open ventrals, and a smile. 
and the person you know, doesn't fall for it, right? They're like, wait, wait, what company are you from? I don't have you on the record. I think to continue doing that is going to make you seem a little weird. No, really, I'm supposed to be here, right? So I think you have to change your, you can't stick with it going, but I'm building oxytocin and report, right? Like, come on, look, look, look. Let me touch you, you know? So I think you, I think, <laughs> well, I can be really misconstrued. But I think, um, I think you have to, I think you, you, you have to uh, think about your proper emotion if you were the person that you're saying you are. So if I'm the IT guy and I'm being stopped, what would be the proper emotion? Well, it may be anger, but I always say don't ever show anger in an engagement, ever. It's, there's no place for it. You're a security professional, you're there to educate. Don't ever show anger. But can you be a little irritated? Can you be like, man, I don't know why I'm not on the list. All I know is I got a call from Bob. He told me to get my butt down here and fix this machine. What do you want me to do? I'm, I'm doing my job just like you, right? And kind of put it back on them um, but have the proper level of emotional response. That's what I usually do. Yeah, no problem. My rule in my company is never break pretext. Never break it, no matter what. Even when you get caught. I got locked in a closet once. I did. I still never broke pretext. <laughs> what? Was there any stomach rubbing in the closet? No, no, no. No, we didn't play spin the bottle in the closet. I got locked in the closet by two security guards. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's a beautiful question. Can I have another hour? Um, is there any way to protect yourself from being manipulated about these things? Am I out of time? I have 31 seconds to answer your question. Go through the tunnel. <laughs> Go through the tunnel. Um, I, don't, I don't think so. I think it's just being aware of what it feels like when this is working on you. And then knowing if someone does this, what their requests are. And if the, requ the next request that comes is inappropriate, to realize that you are being manipulated and not influenced, right? Because being influenced necessarily isn't a bad thing. You know, it's not necessarily a bad thing. If someone's trying to get you to do something, that's not terribly bad. But um, you want to know what it feels like when it's working against you in a bad way and then be able to stop it. Okay, guys, I'd love to answer more of your questions, but we have another speaker. Thank you.